12. I can't believe this is my 17th report to you. It's um, really hard to believe. I found myself going back today. Um, I hope you enjoy the feast of readings that you've just heard. Um, they are worth reflecting upon. Every single reading is so significant and so important. I just want to take you to one section. I was 12 years old at a summer camp in uh, Hendersonville, North Carolina. I've told you about this camp before. It's called Canuga. And they introduced us to an amazing uh, idea for Episcopalian kids. And that was a memory Bible verse. I know this is a very technical term. Let me break it down for you. It, 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 Roman Catholics, Episcopalians, maybe some Lutherans may not be familiar with this concept. It, it is that if you memorize the pieces of the Bible, Scripture verses, God can use those verses to speak uh, to you through them over time. This is a radical concept for Episcopalians. So, uh, I was given a multitude of different verses, no idea about the Bible. I was still you know, a 12-year-old boy, like, how many disciples? Uh, 12. How many commandments? Uh, 10. The ones I broke in, 7. Okay, and um, so I, I was kind of new to all of this Bible uh, memorization. So, um, the verse that I chose is the last verse that you heard in the Old Testament reading. It's from the magnificent journal kept by one of my heroes, a man called uh, uh, Nehemiah. His journal is now the book of Nehemiah in the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament. And it, it really is worth reading. It's worth reading because Nehemiah is part of a generation that was taken uh, uh, basically from exile in Babylon repatriated to the land of their fathers and grandfathers, uh, Jerusalem, the Holy Land. And they were told that this was a magnificent place. It was beautiful. The memories of their grandparents and great-grandparents about the beautiful temple, the walls, the, uh, the, all the magnificence of a great city. They get to Jerusalem, and it's in utter ruins. There's not one stone on another one. Sheep and goats are using the uh, top of where the temple once stood to graze and defecate. It's been utterly destroyed. And Nehemiah is part of a generation, um, not for the first time in that place, that asked the question, can God resurrect a country? And so the book of Nehemiah reports how these guys went out in the day and in the night and they literally rebuilt a physical wall. You can still go to Jerusalem and see the wall that Nehemiah's generation built. They're talking about, oh, we hung out at the water gate. The good news is there was a gate because there was a wall. Nehemiah records that they built with a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other. It was a, probably one of the worst moments of crisis for God's people. It's amazing they survived. So they get together to read the Torah scroll after they've completed the work on Rosh Hashanah, the first day of the Jewish New Year. And as they read the scroll in the Jerusalem again, everyone's crying because it's so emotional. And Nehemiah says, and this is my Bible verse, yes, there is something about food and wine mentioned, but that's not the part I memorized. The very last sentence, the joy of the Lord is your strength. I was 12 years old when I saw those words, and they hit me like a freight train. I was figuring out at 12 who I was, who I was supposed to be, where I was, who I was going to be, how I was going to act. You remember 12? You remember 12? What's the only cure for 12? 13, right? What's the only cure for 13? 14. And uh, what's the cure for 15? College. Just bam. No, I'm just kidding. Um, why do we have a youth pastor? Well, a lot of good reasons. The 
joy of the Lord is your strength. Nehemiah was not talking about a feeling or a platitude. He was talking about a deeply rooted gift that only God can give. It's a life perspective of gratitude and indebtedness to God's grace. It transcends any external moment or challenge. Joy in the Bible is a supernatural ability to rejoice in God's nature, God's action, and God's purpose. To trust that God is exactly who He says He is. That this world somehow is unfolding according to God's plan. I did not know at the age of 12 how to say any of this. But I knew that God had given me something that this verse describes. It's like putting on glasses spiritually and seeing the world. And I have experienced this gift of joy. It's available to every Christian. It's one of the best reasons to be a Christian. I've tried to minister and to serve you out of this sense of a deep joy. That life is to savor and celebrate. That God is worthy of our highest and best worship. That God really does have a plan. Do these sound like familiar statements? They should. I preach about them all the time. I want to tell you, 20 years ago when I was ordained, I didn't know that Baal even existed. I was a southern priest going on to a southern wife and a southern career. Well, I didn't get the southern wife, never had the southern career. I met some southern priests, they're really interesting, but I like it just fine out in Colorado. I have to say that actually you all have taught me so much about how to celebrate, how to savor and experience joy. We renamed this event a Celebration Lunch on the assumption that God was giving us something to be thankful for. Because most people, when you hear the word annual parish meeting, don't just get tingly in the edge of your extremities. Wow, I'm really ready for that annual perish meaning. Well, forget that. Let's celebrate. Let's celebrate what God has done. Paul said, when one person celebrates, rejoices, everyone lights up. When one person uh, weeps, everybody mourns. So I would like to invite you to a celebration today. An acknowledgement of the joy that God has given to all of us to simply be a part of a church like this. I want to tell you that I have the privilege of watching God manifest joy in so many different ways. We have now grown so large that we don't have time for me to enumerate all the ways in the past year. I'd uh, love Patrick to throw up this first slide of the book that is waiting for you. Uh, the cover of the book outside, and it's in it is a report, and I take some time to write in detail about um, all the ways that God has blessed our church. We served over 16,000 people last year. Crazy. Who told us we could do that? In so many different ways. What a privilege to be involved in a church like that. Can I tell you that, um, I ask you to read that report. We work hard to put it together. We're accountable to you, whether you're visiting, seasonal member, uh, married to a member, auditioning to be a member, you're the kid of a member, uh, whether you're a member, we are accountable to you. And this is our statement to you about what God has done in the past year. I'd like you to read it. It's on the website. We have paper copies after the service. Um, 
I want to tell you about my joy in being part of a church that serves so passionately. Almost every major nonprofit in this valley, if I have a question, I can call a member of our church who's in leadership or on staff of almost every significant nonprofit in this valley. Thirty years ago, no one knew our church even existed. That is a great joy. In this church, the first question people ask, well, where's the bathroom? The second question that people ask, generally, is how can we help? How can we help? That's what we want to ask. My joy is in a congregation that worships so honestly. Boy, do we climb mountains together. Boy, do we explore personal valleys together. We seek God's will weekly. And when we get together, we really do enjoy bread and wine and wine and other things. We really enjoy it. If you have not gathered together with us, you're missing the party. I mean, no one can employ a, a, a pastor like Pastor Mark and miss the party. That man, who's not here so I can talk about him, that man pulled out women's underwear in a sermon a week before our bishop visited. Do you remember? Don't get your bloomers in a bundle. And he preached a sermon on that, and people were like moved. It was unbelievable. Some of the best people I have ever met in this room and in this church. And when we get together, God's Spirit is present. It's a beautiful, beautiful gift. Can I tell you that um, I'm filled with joy to watch you give so generously your time, your talent, and your treasure. Someone asked me about our largest and smallest gift in the church. They wanted to know kind of the range of what uh, people give financially. And I said, you know, I can't tell you that. One, I'm a priest. I'm not going to tell you that. Two, I don't really know. Three, there is no small gift in this church. There is no small gift in the kingdom of God. Every gift is humongous. Every gift matters. Your time, your talent, your treasure. And I am privileged to watch you give those gifts over and over again, sacrificially and trusting in God's providence. Um, I have a joy of worshiping in a church that hears the voice of Jesus over the din and the chaos of the world. So many people ask me, what should I do in moments of life like this? And my answer is, let's listen to Jesus tell us together. If you're hearing the voice of Jesus, you need to be here. If you are not hearing the voice of Jesus, or you hear a substitute voice, leave the church and go to a place where you hear the voice of Christ. He speaks so clearly in days like these. Nehemiah heard God's voice in a moment of crisis. So did Paul. When one rejoices, everybody parties. When one weeps, everybody is broken heart. Um, can I tell you that I have a deep joy that we have grown into a partnering congregation in our community? that we are now known as a place where our community can come and, and uh, seek help. We're building a relationship of trust with Eagle County, that we're a leadership congregation in the interfaith community, in the Diocese of Colorado, the Episcopal Church. People call us for help. I'm so proud of that. I hope that you would share in that joy. Can I tell you the joy I have that we employ and deploy the coolest, most talented, most dedicated staff I have ever had the privilege of working with. It is ridiculous that you all can have a staff of the caliber that you have. It's crazy. Um, how many times have I been asked if Deacon Steve can drive weekly to the front range? My answer in all Christian charity is, don't ask me, ask his wife. <laughs> no, we get it here. 
Margie, who's sitting back there, Barbara Jean up with the children, Scott up with the youth, Bonnie that's here now, Sandy in the nursery, Mary Cotton. You all are served by some of the most talented people I've ever met. It's a source of deep joy, and we have a good time. This morning, I want to highlight just a few particular other joys. These are new announcements, and uh, I invite you to, uh, uh, to look at them. Uh, Patrick's going to throw screen number two up. We are getting a playground. We're getting two playgrounds. As part of the Edwards Chapel ongoing quiet fundraising effort, we have had members of our church put a challenge grant out to build two playgrounds. One right here for our little wee ones, and one off to the side of the building. No more in the parking lot during the week. We're going to work as hard as we can to get this done as smoothly as we can. I can't tell you when, but we're going to be working on it soon, and we've started discussions now. Isn't that great? We go out for a fundraiser, and what do people talk to us about? Endowing the building? No. These people don't even have kids in our church, and they want to see our kids play on the playground. That is just an amazing joy. I'm debuting that announcement now. In 2014, we're going to celebrate 40 years as a congregation, the fact that we're still here. Some of you were here, I remember, for 25 years. Our church is turning 40 in 2014. Why have they let Vail have all the fun? So we're going to do a year-long celebration of the 40th anniversary. 40 is a very good biblical number. <coughs> Can I tell you that I've asked a new Holy Trinity to help me with this effort? Three people that I've always had a blast in the same room. Sandy Kinsley, Debbie Huga Horvath, and Lucy Davis will be our new Holy Trinity. And they are going to be helping us design some celebrations around our 40th anniversary. Let me just tease you with one that I have not shared with anybody except the clergy. Would anybody come with me in the fall of 2014? to worship at the original church of the Transfiguration. It's on a mountain in the northern plain of Galilee. It's called Mount Tabor. It's the scariest taxi ride you'll ever have <laughs> up a mountain. It's one of the most beautiful mountains in the Holy Land. Why let Pastor Mark have all the fun with going on a trip, a pilgrimage? Would anybody want to come? If we went to the Church of the Transfiguration to celebrate our 40th anniversary, that's one thought that I've had. Maybe you have some more. I'd like to debut this morning that we have been invited into some preliminary conversations in Eagle and Gypsum about a fourth interfaith site. By invitation of a standing congregation down valley. They've looked up Valley, and they've seen us, and they've seen what we do, and they say, could we do this down here? I said, I don't know. Let's have the conversation. So I and selected members of our vestry and others are going to be entering into conversation about the future of extending our interfaith ministry down Valley. I don't know where that goes. We're just going to start talking. That fulfills a prayer I've had for 17 years, that we would have a valley-wide footprint. Very, very interesting indeed. Can I tell you that um, I want to thank our vestry. You're going to see in our book that they have articulated an end statement. A new picture of what we are supposed to be doing as a church. The vision about how to go forward. Clergy and lay people partnering together. It's not Father Knows Best. The vestry worked very hard this year. I want to say thank you to Doug Dusenberry, our senior warden, who's here with us this morning for his leadership in that effort and his partnership. It's been awesome. I want to thank Linda Tassillo, our retiring junior warden uh, from, from this uh, worship site in Edwards, for her leadership there. Dan Smith, our retiring junior warden in Vail, who's here with us. I want to say thank you to our wardens and others who are retiring. Uh, what a tremendous team that we've had on our vestry, the board of our church. 
and the end statement is in the uh, report. I'd love for you to read it. God's birthing some new ministries. Have you heard about food, uh, Full Belly's food rescue? You know there's no, there was no organized food rescue in the whole valley? You know how many restaurants we have? How much food gets thrown away? After a funeral in this building, a boulder of faith, I had a conversation with one person and I said, do you think God could be calling our church to a ministry of food beyond what we've done? Well, the answer is yes. Suzanne Hoffman is a new member of our church. She's seated right here. And she has started single-handedly a food rescue organization called Full Bellies under the umbrella of our church. Who would be willing on a Sunday night to drive to a restaurant and pick up food that they're about to toss so we can feed it for the next three weeks of our community meal? Suzanne can't do this by herself. I think it's one of the most exciting developments in the past 10 years. Please speak to Suzanne. Um, I've asked Barb Hogeboom, our former senior warden, to lead a discernment team. Before Steve was ordained, he needed to pray with a group of people that said, is he being called to be a deacon? 28 times this past year, roughly, I sat with people who looked me in the eye, some of you are here, and said, what's God calling me to do? How do I hear the voice of God in my life? What's available for me to, to do and to serve? I said, boy, we need someone who's good at this. I've asked Barb Hogeboom to assemble a team, not to produce more deacons, although they might. They might, Steve, yes. But, so that anybody here can call Barb totally confidentially, sit with her and her team over prayer and conversation and discern ministries for which you might be being called. We don't need to be a mile wide and an inch deep. We need to be deep and wide. Barb and her team are going to help us do that. Tom Walker, you're going to be fed a meal today through a new food ministry, new to us, that Tom Walker is going to be exercising in our church. Uh, uh, we need to fund it, uh, for sure. But we've gotten too large. The old potluck model starts to break down. I love mac and cheese, however, you know. And, and so, um, Tom Walker is starting with us, through Bonnie's leadership, a new food ministry for us. Unbelievable. Can I tell you about, finally, the sabbatical? More questions in the past several months. May I tell you that on a schedule, I am allotted a sabbatical program by Vestry Policy. Can I tell you that I asked for a sabbatical this year because I know that about every six to seven years, I need to step away from a relentless daily demand of ministry that is beyond my ability to control. I'm not supposed to. That's why I'm ordained. The collar reminds clergy that someone else is in the driver's seat. Can I tell you that this is a time for me to study and reflect and restore the energy and enthusiasm and perspective that you expect and should expect of all of your clergy? Can I tell you that when I think about joy, I think about a church who is generous enough to allow your priest to take the time away every seven years that he needs. This is not a year-long deal. It's three months and a week, and maybe a few other days than that. Now, April, May, and June. Can I tell you that the title of my sabbatical leave is Green Pastures, Still Waters, taken from the 23rd Psalm. I'm going to be going in pastures and by a lot of water which gives me life. I'm going to be doing a program designed to explore the footsteps of Paul and the world of the early church. I need to go to the places where Christians have suffered and sacrificed and died and built. That is Turkey. Do we have, uh, do, can we have uh, Istanbul for us? There is Istanbul. Along with the help
help of many other people, including Mark and Steve, I have designed a program of travel and study and pilgrimage. We're going to have a goodbye event on Easter morning after the Easter Day service here. Bonnie and the staff are putting together an Easter egg hunt for the children after church and a brunch. We were concerned that not everybody could pay $40 or $50 or $60 a plate for brunch. So we're going to have a brunch right here for you after church. A real brunch. A real Easter egg hunt. And we're going to have a goodbye event for me. Keys and prayer book go to Pastor Mark as our liturgical leader and to Doug as our governance leader, the head of our vestry. And then the next day I fly to this temple. This isn't just for me. I've started a blog. I'm not on Facebook. I don't tweet or Twitter or whatever that is. I don't do that. But I am going to blog. Actually, I have two blog entries already in. Travelpod.com. Put my name in, Brooks Key. I'm going to be communicating on a regular basis as long as I have internet. I want to share this experience with you. The children are going to be tracking my progress in Sunday school through Turkey and Greece and Malta and Italy. They're going to call it Where in the World is Father Brooks? <laughs> with a map. You're going to be hearing sermons based on the biblical places where we're visiting. And guess who's doing Greece with me? I'm fortunate enough to steal the deacon who's never been to Greece. Just for several days. Now, and we're going to go pray and read and study and put our feet where Paul and Barnabas and Silas and Luke and Perpetua and Gregory of Nyssa and all the heroes that I've studied about my whole life. Can I tell you, after that, some other time with my family, I end up in New York City doing some worship at Jewish synagogues, different synagogues, and engagement with the Jewish community, maybe even visiting the Palestinian and the Israeli delegations of the United Nations. You will get a better priest when I return. I want to be clear about all of this so that you understand what I'm doing and I'll start talking about this now more. Would you go to that travelpod.com? Check out the blog. Let me know what you think. Because I like to write and I don't get a, a lot of chances to do that. What stands in our way of the plans we have for this year? Well, distraction, division, and fatigue. I feel it every day and I hear it from you. And Paul says, you are the body of Christ. We're stronger together than we are apart. May I tell you, friends, that God is calling this church to stand as a beacon in times of darkness and chaos. People depend on us as a congregation. We can't let them down. Distraction and division and fatigue. By the way, the rector goes on sabbatical. Guess what happens the next Sunday? Eucharist right here. We're going to feature our fantastic staff. Every ministry goes on exactly as it did before. I forgot to tell you, Senior Sunday, Rebecca's sitting right here. Uh, the Norrises are sitting right here. Senior Sunday, the Sunday before graduation, I'm going to come back to be here that Sunday sitting with you in the congregation and I am going to give the sermon that day because I cannot miss Cal and Rebecca and Carl and Stefan and our other graduating seniors. I will be back for that Sunday, but I'll be wearing a shirt like you all were. I'd love to see you that day. Um, can I tell you that the sheer weight of pastoral and leadership <coughs> demands could slow us down? We're learning how to evolve to try and meet all the demands, but they are a lot. 
and we ask for your patience as we evolve as a staff to do that. And finally, can I tell you that we do continue to need, is anybody surprised by this, your financial generosity to make all this work? More about that from Jim and John and, and Mike in our annual meeting. Children are coming in, it must be time to continue. So may I say thank you, and may I take you back, please, to the greatest strength that I can find, and that is the strength of God and God's joy. Let's share it together. Would you please stand? The peace of the Lord be always with you. Shall we share a sign of God's peace?